you very much, Brother Hunt. It's uh, deemed this another great privilege to be here in the, this auditorium tonight to, in the service of the Lord. And now tomorrow night is a special night for prayer for the sick. Uh, for the, I believe they give it over mostly to the people that are they're going to come from the hospitals and things. Usually in the meetings when we have it set up, we have a, a, an emergency room that where that when they have a big meeting where they where people can get in and be prayed for each time when they come they can't get into the prayer line. We have a room that maybe they've come for flew in by plane or something for hundreds of miles and just have to be there that one night and go back. So we always try to catch them all. But when we're having this type of service, I, I feel that every person that's in the building is prayed for each night. See, because as I try to make it plain, you see, that that if there was, I, I see a, like a man sitting here in a wheelchair. If I know that there, if I could take a quarter and push it with my nose around this city, we have that man to get up out of that chair and be made well, I'd do it. Sure, I'd certainly do it. And now maybe he'll live an ordinary lifetime sitting in that chair. But maybe there's a man sitting out there somewhere that's got heart trouble, in just a few hours and now he's going to be dead, unless something helps him. He's in a more critical condition than this man sitting in the chair. Then I would push the quarter certainly around the city with my nose, which would take me days to do it. But... And I probably have no nose left when I got through pushing it around. But I would do it to see that poor mortal heal. So I, I cannot heal anyone. I never have healed anyone, but I have seen tens of thousands healed. And so I, if only thing I try to do is to get them to have faith in what's already appropriated for them. So when you see, you just think, if Jesus came here tonight and was wearing this suit of clothes that he gave me, and you walk up to him and say, Lord, will you heal me? He would perhaps look astonished at you and say, you're a believer in me. Do not you read the scriptures? Yes, Lord. Well, did not you read that where I purchased your healing at Calvary? I have already done it like if you, here's what it is. If you ever seen anything in a pawn shop, and then you go and redeem that from the pawn shop, you cannot redeem it the second time. It's already redeemed. If someone gives you a ticket where the price has been paid, and that article is redeemed, it's redeemed. You don't have to pay for it a second time. That's where Moses made his sin, but striking the rock the second time instead of speaking to it. See? He smote it the first time. What did it speak of? The weakness of the blood of Jesus that it had to be smitten for each individual. Christ is smitten for our healing. We just speak to the rock now. And it brings forth its healing. But, you see, we have been taught wrong. All about this year, laying on of hands and sensations. And don't never build your, your hopes of salvation upon a sensation. Because you can have all kinds of sensations. But... Build it upon the Word of God. There's where you can beat Satan any time. Upon the Word. It's thus saith the Lord. Remember one night, I don't want to keep you here. I ain't going to say nothing now. I would, so many things that if I could stay here for a month, I could half, not half help. If I could write and book, but what I have seen the Lord do would almost make a library in itself. Hundreds of books would write of the things that I've seen. Just, just know he did it. And these, about 35 years, or 31 years it is, of service for him. And I've seen him do in the meetings that I've held. And around the world. And there are great things that are startling. And it, well, I can remember them and think of them. But we don't write of them. Just let them go because... Sometimes Jesus said, see that you tell nobody. After all, Jesus died for a people that God foreknew would be saved. You see. Now that is true. He came to save that which was lost. But by his foreknowledge, he knew which would be saved. Now, 
healing certainly is for everybody that has faith enough to receive it. Salvation is for everybody who has faith enough to receive it. In a meeting, if I'm not mistaken, is right here in Illinois. Uh, is there a little place up here called Van Daly or something? Van Daly? Van? I believe that's where it is that. Van Daly or, or just across the river in Missouri. It was somewhere here, I believe, in Illinois. Coming through the line one night, there was a lady, and uh, you had to watch what he said. Now, in these visions that you see here taking place in the platform, I don't do that. You know who does that? You do it. You don't know it, but you're the one that's doing it. You say, Brother Brandon, that's exactly right, class. You do that yourself. It's just, I wish I could explain it, but there's no way of doing it. It's just like shifting your car and getting it into a gear. See? And it's just like the Holy Spirit, just a gift to know how to shift yourself out and let Him do the talking. See? Shift yourself out. Then it isn't you talking, it's Him. And you do that yourself. To try to make a little exclamation of it, I'd say, exclamation, I'd say this. Maybe we're all, we all go to a carnival. There's this carnival coming to the city of Circus. And we're all up here, we ministers, we're, we're young fellows, and we won't get in to see that. So it happened to be that I was a great, big, tall, skinny fellow. And uh, the brother here was short and sturdy. Now, he'd maybe have a better chance to be stronger than I am. Well, now, he could pack water. He's big and strong. He could do things that I couldn't do at all. Now, I can't help because I'd be tall and skinny. He can't help because he's short and strong. See? Who taking thought can add one cubic to his statue, said Jesus? We are what we are. And that's one thing that's hurt our Pentecostal move in other moves is somebody trying to be something that they're not. They're trying to impersonate someone else. You can't do that. You're just what you are. That's all. And when you do that, God will use you. You're just what you are. And you're just as important as anybody else. As I said the other night, the little bitty hairspring in this watch is just as important as the mainspring because it takes it all together to make time. And that when we realize our position in Christ and then abide in that. If it's just a little housewife, stay right there. That's what God wants you to do. See? Just be what you are. And uh, many of you remember the healing of Congressman Upshaw. Had been in a wheelchair for 66 years, served 17 years in the United States government as a, as a congressman and so forth. Never seen him in my life. And Dr. Roy E. Davis of the Missionary Baptist Church that baptized me into the Baptist Church. Uh, a faith was uh, a Baptist fellowship, we call it. We believe that in the Baptist church that the Spirit baptizes you into the body, but we are baptized. If you've been a Camelite and been immersed in what you want to, when you come into the Baptist church, you've got to be baptized over into that fellowship. So we call it baptized into the fellowship of the Baptist church. He was the one sent Congressman Upshaw there that was, and he was. Never seen him just walk into the building there in Los Angeles where thousands upon thousands of wheelchairs there were. And I seen him in a vision and began to speak. And he was healed that night for the first time out of that chair without those crutches and things for 66 years. Boy. Congressman William D. Upshaw. Fine friend, uh, Churchill and all those. And as you all know that when I went there and prayed for King George when he had multiple sclerosis and he was healed instantly the next day, played 18 holes of golf and he couldn't even set up for just a few minutes at a time. And I was up to Gusto's and Gusto's brother is a Pentecostal. And why do you, some of you people down in the Pentecostal is because you live here in a little city and don't know the rest of the world. 40% of our government is Pentecostal. That's right, or either Pentecostal influence. Billy Graham said, no longer can you hide the Pentecostal church. It's the fastest growing church in the world. All right. What did our Sunday visitor the Catholic Church make a statement? That last year alone, the Pentecostals had a million five hundred thousand registered converts. More than all the rest of them put together. All right. All right. We're not a bunch of trash. Amen. We've come out of the alley. We're up on glory. All right. But we're... The Pentecostal church and the government officials and all 
I had breakfast with Mr. Nixon right there in Washington, D.C., and been speaking in a few days with some of the state senators in my home. I asked my secretary these private interviews like we had this morning, and what we have of a morning where the people come to uh, find out what the Lord has to say. They stay there. We wait there until the Lord speaks. Not like these little visions you see here. I mean, you do them. But doctors, statesmen, congressmen, potentates from the world over. I was talking to my secretary. That's his mother and his father-in-law and mother-in-law sitting right there now. The other day, I, they're waiting on the list from internationally. Over 600 waiting now from around the world. Come in and set before the Lord and we pray until he comes down and tells them what to do. Doctors, statesmen, lawyers, congressmen, and everything else in the nation over. Even I've had doctors from Mayo Brothers Clinic. Not something just hearsay, friends. God. So here's what the visions are. Now in these meetings, these evangelistic meetings, you don't see one-tenth of it. Ask the brethren who go with me. These are just little, these are something that you do yourself. Now here, and I'll go back to my point. Excuse me for leaving it. But we're going to a carnival. And there's a great big circus. There's a big board fence around it. And we, we don't know how to get over it, so we want to see what's on the inside. And there's no man in the world but what wants to know where he come from, what he is, and where he's going. There's only one book that can tell you, and that's this. Well, who you are, where you come from, and where you're going. But every human being likes to look past the curtain to see what's on the other side. Well, we're going to do that now for a parable. And now, we go along, and I look at this brother, and I'm a stronger, great, strong-looking man, me a little skinny fellow. Well, I think of Maybe he can do his part towards getting in to see the, the, the show, what's on the inside. Well, how am I going to do it? The first thing you know, I happen to spy a knothole way up high. Now, he can't reach up there. See? But I can. So, but to do it, I have to reach down and jump real high, and I get a hold just with my fingers and pull myself up and look through that knothole. Like, it really takes the life out of me and drop down. What did you see, Brother Brandon? A giraffe. Oh, he did. What else did you see? That's all I had time to see. <laughs> like the kill. See? Look and see if you can see something else. Now, you don't realize it, but that's you on the platform and that's you sitting out there. You're the one that knocks the strength out of you. Last night, someone was coming, almost fell four or five times getting out. You don't, people don't realize that. If you read the Bible, do you know what poets or prophets or so forth, they go into inspiration, sometimes they don't even know where they're at. Did you ever read of uh, Stevens Foster? Wrote the old Kentucky home, way down upon the Swanee River. Gave America its best folk songs. He was considered an erotic. Every time he'd write a song, inspiration, then he'd go out and get on a drum. One time when he wrote he come out, he just come out of it, he got a razor, called a servant, and committed suicide, cut his throat. Did you ever hear of William Kepper? Certainly you have. I stood by his grave recently and cried. He, he was considered in England a, a goofy guy, crazy. Anybody that's real spiritual, science says, is just one stage away from insanity, from the world. So it's a human mind trying to cope with that mind there, you can't. You don't realize. No one will ever know this side of eternity, what it means. So then, and William Camper finally, the day, you remember when he tried to even get in a cab and go commit suicide, come back, got a rope and tried to hang himself, and, and went out and tried to drown in the river, and then wrote that famous song, There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, where sinners plunge beneath the flood, lose all their guilty stain. Look at the prophet Jonah. As soon as he came out of the belly of the whale and went and gave his prophecy, as long as the inspiration was only giving his prophecy, he was fine. But when the inspiration left him, he sat on top of a mountain and prayed for God to take his life. The prophet Elijah, under a, a vision of the Lord, 
fixed it and called fire out of heaven, called rain out of heaven the same day, and killed 400 priests himself. And then when the inspiration left him, run at the threat of a woman and was 40 days and nights out in the wilderness, not even knowing where he was at, wandering around, and God found him pulled back in the cave. Is that scripture? See, people don't realize it. You don't realize what things... You say, well, if I had a ministry like that, you'd both get rid of it right quick. You don't realize what it does to you. It kills you. But it, it, God has given it to you. Critics laugh, make fun, everything. And me standing right here, I know what they're thinking. Certainly I do. I used to call them out and say everything. But when I did, I found out it hurts. Jesus said, let them both grow together. Don't pull up the terrier. That's God's time at the end to pull the terrier out, see, at the end of the harvest. Just let them alone, see. Go ahead, I've got ministry to serve, and so i God to serve, and I just do it the best I can, and then go on. Well, now, when you come to the platform, that's you that's doing that, like the woman touched his garment. It's your own faith that does it. I have nothing to do with it. To me, I, I can do nothing. I've asked God for something to over and over myself for the past five years, and he won't even say a word to me about it. My old mother was laying here dying and saying, Son, what shall be my end? And my sweet old mother, I couldn't tell her until God tells me. See? Uh, he has to speak. I don't do the speaking, it's him. And it's not me that causes the vision here on the platform. Ask my brethren that's with me. This week I have eaten nothing but crackers and milk. It's true. It's fasting, waiting, seeing which way the Spirit will lead me. The boys at the door said, there's a big smarters board down here. Brother Brandon, how you love to sm- uh, go to a smart? I said, I do, but not in healing services. <laughs> Wait on the Lord. This comes out only by fasting and praying. Here comes tomorrow night when cripples and hospital cases and dying people will be sitting here. Be ready for it. If you love people, and if you don't love people, you might as well get out of the ministry. That's all, because if your heart don't burn for them... I'd rather you'd say something good about my son than you'd say about me because that's my son. And if we can't love one another, how are we going to love God who we haven't seen? We must find the thing we've got to love one another, though we differ. You've got to love anyhow. You can't bluff it. You've got to really do it. You've got to... And that the greatest power I've ever found in healing is love. When you have sympathy and love for the people, trying to help them. Sometimes I scold them and, and go back and go home and just think, Lord, what did I do it for? But it's because I love them. If I have to scold my little boy for running out on the street, he'll get killed if I don't get him off that street. Sometimes I have to whip him, correct him, say, Son, stay off of that street. Not because I don't love that child, it's because I do love him. That's the way God has to do to us. Scold us and shake us. Make us a real true a person that lets his child just do anything is not a good parent. That's right. There's too much of that in America today. And uh, we need the old-fashioned mothers. Now, someone comes to the platform, a, a lady. Here I am. I've got myself relaxed. And she comes up. Who is she? I've never seen her. I don't know her. What is she? I don't know. Oh, God, I'm depending on you. Now, all day long, I prayed. What is it, Lord? Step across this Bible here. God, there's your word. You made the promise. Between me and that woman stands your word. Your spirit's here somewhere. God, maybe one thing, it might set this whole building afire. Maybe the Holy Spirit has come in and ward off all the unbelief tonight. There's nothing in here but what's going to believe me. Everything's going to believe because I've preached it just as simple as I can. And they've read the Bible and know it's the truth and a promise for this day. Surely they will, Lord. Then trying to relax myself talking. The first thing you know, what am I doing? Reaching up. Reaching up. Find out what kind of faith that woman's got. Finally, find she's got faith. What does it do? It touches. Then between her and I, I see it. Now where I go? Here, up, up, up. Grab it. You have tumor. Yes, sir. You turn towards the audience. He guessed that. See? Well, that's mental telepathy. Dr. Jones said it was so-and-so. Oh, that's mind reading. See, there you are again. Well, what can you see? You look out there. Your said this one, that one. Up here, down there it is, back here. God, what can I? Well, Lord, you had to go through the same thing. Now, what else did? What else is wrong with her? Here you go again. 
You're already fingers aching as it was hanging on there. Now your heart's aching. Okay? And up you go again. And besides that, you got TB. You were at a doctor the other day, and he told you, you were, he was a tall man. You read their mind. Isn't that strange? Even Christians say, well, I suppose it's all right. Okay. Well, after a while, that one passes by. Here's another one. Then you're just about sagged out. See? Here's another one. Well, there stands a whole line of them. If you don't get every one of them, boy, they never got prayed for. It. Something wrong. <laughs> See, I'm trying to use a prophetic gift in an evangelistic service. That's the reason it don't work so well. It does in Africa. It does anywhere else but the United States. Anywhere else but here, it'll work. It doesn't here. People just don't get it. I don't know why, but they don't. That one thing can happen in Africa. Thousands will rush to the altar, scream and cry, and jump out of their wheelchairs if they have to crawl or anything else. They believe God. That's all. They get it. But we've been see we've been indoctrinated with so many different isms and so many different things. Somebody says it's this. Somebody says it's that. And he belongs to another church. He's not. He's not one of us. He's a holy roller. He, he, he might be a medium. He might be a devil. He, see, and all that that just greenies. Then somebody say, "Huh, I'll get out of here right now." Oh. See? Now, how can you have a meeting under that? You let me ask you something. Throw this audience of one card with one faith one time. Let me guarantee you in the name of the Lord, there won't be a wheelchair left in here while people be walking. You just try it one time and find out. I've seen it. 25,000 got in wheelchairs, stretchers, and everything else in walk. But... You got the ministry anyhow. This is a nation that's got the money to send me on. They haven't got money to bring me. I ain't got no big backing up on anything. I have to just depend on God. You you have mercy. Do something. Wherever you lead me, I'll go. And that's what I do. See. Now, perhaps maybe the ringmaster comes by now. What are you boys looking at? We were looking in, sir. Oh, well, come here. He's a great, big fella. Reaches down, picks me up into his hand. So now I'll tell you how this goes, Brother Branham. You see that show over there? Yeah, now that's where the garland ride starts there. They come out here and they ride around this way. They come through here and they do this and this does this and this that. Oh, yes, sir. Set in the palm of his hand. And this is this and this is it. Sets me down there at the grandstand, you know, and we show me everything's going to happen. Oh, I say, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Now you be a good boy. Thank you, sir. Why have you? What did you see? Oh, bless God! You see, see, I'm not tired. See, he just lifted me up and showed me. Now that's you using God's gift or God using His own gift. See, now you say is that scriptural? Yes, brother. A woman touched his garment one time, and he said, "I got weak." Is that right? But one day when he was in the home of Martha and Mary, and then he, uh, the, God showed him, he said he'd done nothing until the Father showed him, and God showed him that Lazarus was going to die. So he said, you go away and they're going to send for you. Yeah, I approve that. He said, go away and after four days he's going to die, and then you go back and you wake him, go to the grave and wake him, and so forth, because he had to done it, or if he didn't, he told something wrong. So he went, and they sent for him. Did he go back? Your friend Lazarus sick, ready to die. You know what the father told him, so he just went on. They sent again, Lazarus sick, come see him right quick, he's going to die. He just went on. If you'd have sent for your pastor and he didn't come, you went and joined the next church. See? That's the reason you don't get nowhere. You've got to believe the servant God sent you. See? If he's led of the Spirit, let him alone. Then, uh, after four days, Jesus turned around because that's what the Father no doubt had told him because he said he did nothing the Father showed him. Uh, he turned around and said to his disciples, he knew the time was fulfilled. He said, our friend Lazarus is asleep. Oh, they said he's doing well. He said, then he told them in their own language, he said, he's dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there. So, he said, but I'll go with him. And when he got to the grave, listen to what he said. I thank thee, Father, thou hast already seen but I just say these, this for those who stand by. I said it for their sake, you see. 
Then he said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came forth. He never said a thing about getting weak, did he? That was God using his gift. The other was a woman using his gift. You see the difference? You understand now? Amen. That's what it's, it's you that's doing it. Now in the interviews and so forth, they have uh, times where the Holy Spirit, like sitting this morning before a young couple, how it went down through their life, picks it up and brings it back. And my your famous doctor sat in the room recently and asked me about a certain thing. I said, will you pray with me? He said, I will, sir. We knelt down and prayed. I said, now you're studying of building a clinic and there's a certain thing fixed to happen and you looked at a certain place to build this clinic. You said they couldn't touch it for 25 years. But I said, thus saith the Lord, doctor. He said, do you think the city needs a clinic? I said, yes, sir, it needs a clinic. I think you're a fine doctor, so you go in. He said, it can't be that old. It can't be there. So that I've done fault that in court. He said, you can't build it there. I said, it'll be built out of a red brick. It'll have a light roof on it. It'll almost be a city block on. It'll be there, and your name will be on the front of it. I saw it. Thus saith the Lord. He said, I'd like to believe that, sir. I said, do you remember when you sent me that man not long ago that didn't even have any liver, half of it, eat out that minister? That morning I saw those five apples come down and a big healthy apple eat up the unhealthy apples. And I told you, thus saith the Lord, he'd live. And you said, how can you live without a liver in you? I said, he's preaching. He took my place at the Milltown Baptist Church. I said, it's still there. He said, oh, I remember Reverend William Hall, Milltown Baptist Church. I said, he's still there. That's been about five years ago. I said, your clinic will be there. He said, I hope you're right. And I said, hope. I said, he's always right. And so the next morning he called me up. He said, Brother Branham, I said, he said, I'm freezing to death. And it was in July. I said, freezing to death. He said, shivers running over me. said, they had a meeting in Boston last night with all the bids in for that place. They picked me. It ain't going to have to wait 25 years. It's already set. I bought the place already this morning. There's a clinic right there. <laughs> in St. Louis, just recently, a great medical meeting. He made a speech and he told that. Got a sign that was sticking on his door, engraved in brass. He said, if anybody ever doubts any physician, have him to call me collect. <laughs> That's him. Oh, you see, friends, it's not nothing. It, the thing of it is you can't wake yourself up. That's all. You can't wake yourself up to the reality of what it is. You children and you people here in this wheelchair, you know how to help you like I'm doing. You know it. Uh, God bless your heart, I certainly do it. But you're no more to heal a person in a wheelchair is no more than heal a woman's heart, brother. And the greatest thing you ever done was save a man's soul to change his whole disposition. Yeah, that's right. as far. You just think you're bound for all the time. You're not. No, sir. I've seen tens of thousands of wheelchairs that people heal out of. See? And I know. And it is true. Someone said my grammar's bad. I remember in Fort Wayne not long ago, I was preaching at B.E. Rediger where his daughter had been healed of insanity. A few days ago, oh, there I go again. So many things to say. An insane girl that was going to the morgue and the Catholic school wouldn't even let me in. I went in as a visitor, spoke to the girl a few minutes. I said, Holy Father, I used to go with the girl's mother. I said, Thus saith the Lord. She has her right mind. Her mother grabbed me around the waist and she said, look to her husband, she said, he's never wrong. I said, now she didn't mean me, she meant the Spirit of the Lord. About two hours after that, the father called me up weeping. He said, Brother Branham, I don't know what to say. His daughter was just only 18 years old, teacher of music, right. and played the overtures and so forth, same studies that my daughter is studying. He said, I don't know what to say. He said, that girl instantly come to herself and these doctors are holding a council right now. He said, she's going home with us this afternoon. Right. That's what I said. He said, oh, I'll blast it to the country. I said, shh, tell no one. Go ahead, thank God and move on. He said, just keep going on. He's wonderful if you'll just believe him. One more little thing to you people. Just because that you're here in the meeting and you accept your healing, it don't happen right away, don't pay attention to that. It will happen if you've got enough faith to believe it'll happen. There was a woman coming to the meeting one night. She passed through. She had stomach trouble. The Holy Spirit said to her, You are Mrs. So-and-so. You came from a certain place that you have a stomach trouble. 
and said, what it is, it's a duodenal ulcer. said, it's very dangerous. And the doctor says that you might hemorrhage with it sometime because he's been wanting to operate. I said, but you're afraid of the operation, and therefore you're not able to eat anything hard at all but just broths and stiffer like a bullion and so forth. She said, that's right. And uh, she said, is he right, Mr. Brennan? I said, certainly your doctor is right. And I said, the reason is because it was caused by tension. You're under such a tension all the time. She said, I had been a nervous child. I looked at her, and I see her sitting down by a nice big steak eating, you know, and eating a piece of apple pie. That's what I saw in the vision. I said, but thus saith the Lord. Now watch what it says, see. You're the one that's making it say this, but look what it says behind it. That's the thing, see. You say, you got a cancer, you know that. But see what he says about that cancer, see. That's when you're watching. So then, and uh, she and it told her. So she said, I'm going out and eat. So she went out and eat. And uh, a little bit behind that come a lady that had a big growth on her throat. And the Holy Spirit told her, that growth shall leave you, thus saith the Lord. So they happened to be neighbor women. And so the next day she tried to eat, and oh my, she liked to die. And so she tried for two or three days, and she'd just vomit and gag and blood fly out of her mouth and everything. And her, after about a week, her husband, being a Christian, but he said, Honey, said, you're bringing reproach up on the cause. Said, you mustn't say things like that. She started crying. She said, Hubby, listen. She said, That man did never see me in his life. And by some sort of a power that I believe was the Holy Spirit, according to what I read in this Bible, he told me what my trouble was, who I was, exactly to the letter, and told me, as thus saith the Lord, that I'd be well. She said, until that time comes, I'm going to be acting like it. <laughs> Good. Good. So he said, go ahead, burst your ulcer, and then you'll bleed to death. She just went on. Of course, he, he didn't have, see, it never happened to him, it happened to her. It wasn't his faith, it was hers. Well, about two months passed. Nothing happened. One morning, the children had left to go to school, and she was washing the dishes, and she was singing, and after a while, she had the funniest feeling come over, she said. She'd come testify of it. So it said the funniest feeling went over. She got real hungry at me, and she said, well, the children left some oats in their plates. You know, I guess mothers do that. And so she got a, a little bit of the oats and eat it. And she thought she usually would vomit with it. So she got a little oats and she eat it. And that toast looks so good. She was taking a bite of the toast some of the kiddies had left. So she went on a few minutes and she was still hungry. Didn't vomit. So she just poured her out some. Stirred them up. Eat her a piece of toast. Went on washing. She just felt fine. Fixed her house around. She got real hungry again. So she just went and fried her two eggs and some bacon and got a cup of coffee and had a gastronomical jubilee. So she just really got ready for it. So she just eat all she could. Waited about to about 10 o'clock. Nothing happened. She just getting hungry again. So she thought, oh, praise God. She said, I'm going down to tell my neighbor. And when she got down there, she heard someone screaming and crying. So she knocked the door and shut the door. Nobody answered. She thought maybe somebody had died. And so she ran into the house real quick and hear this woman with a sheet in her hand, shaking it like that and screaming at the top of her voice. And she said, what's the matter? She said, you know what? Said, last night I was standing before the mayor, looked at that knob on my neck. Now look, it's gone. Said, I shot every sheet and everything else trying my best to find. And I woke up this morning and... Now I've got their names and address, see, documented statements, and see what it was when that angel of God, now anybody that's a Bible student knows that sometimes that God does not come right on the scene when he, when he should come, and we think he should. Remember Daniel prayed his 21 days before the angel could get to him, is that right? Amen. All right. How many knows that? Yes, what happened? The very angel of God that made the promise... Not me now. I had nothing to do with it. I didn't know. But said, Thus saith the Lord. It took him almost two months, but he was passing through the neighborhood, confirming that word that he had spoken. Glory to God. If that ain't the same God in the Bible, I don't want my Bible. That's 
happened tens of hundreds of times, friend. So what am I saying that for? Building your faith for tomorrow night's healing service. I want you to, if it not, don't bluff it. It won't bluff. You can't bluff the devil. You remember when Jesus gave his church, like he gave his church power in St. Matthew, the 10th chapter, to cast out devils, he was sick, and, and you know, the lepers to raise the dead. Is that right? Now, I want somebody who doesn't believe in divine healing, show me by the scripture where he ever took that power away from the church. I want the chapter, the Amen. book, and the verse. Amen. Amen. Where he give that power to his church. I can show you chapter, book, and verse where he told them it would be at all races, all places, to all the world. Now you tell me where he said I made a mistake. I got to take it back. That's right. Amen. Show it to me. Some credit. Yeah. It's not in God's word. Now, if, see, it isn't where you're looking at, my critical friend. Is this? You're looking at the weakness. You're looking at what the people is doing about it. But don't look at that. That's what God said about it. Amen. That's it. You're looking at the wrong way. You're cross-eyed. See? And a man's cross, I don't know which way he's going. See? So you just, you look single-eyed at God, what God said, not what people's doing about it, what the seminary said, but what God said. Amen. And if this isn't the Word of God, then go get something that is the Word of God. Amen. No wonder the priest has, a Catholic priest has to be so smart. He's got 600 books that he has to learn is just as sacred to him as that Bible. Six hundred other Bibles, like, of other men who wrote books. And he's got to learn. Smart. in no way to keep up with him. Talk about when it comes to intellectual. But God don't use that at all. That's foolish to him. The humility of believing in Jesus Christ. Is what yeah. God respect. Makes it even a fool should not err in him. Now, now look here. That Jesus in Matthew 10 had gave them power to heal the sick. They went out and cast out the devils, come back rejoicing and so forth. And ten days after that time, they were totally defeated on an epileptic case. That's right. That's right. I can imagine here Andrew says, step back, boys. Sure, you can't do it. Let me show you how I've done over at Capernaum. Come in. Let's the Lord. Come out of him, devil. Come out of him, devil. Hallelujah. Come out of him, devil. Boy just kept on in the spasm. And I can hear Peter say, Oh, ha, ha, ha. remember, you all don't know. Let me show you how I've done it. Got a job. Come here. Let me have you. Pour some water on him and say, This is the way you do it. And there's all been needed. <laughs> Not because they didn't have power. Not a lot. Natural while, look coming down off the mountain. I see him come walking. Quietly. Bible said there's no beauty we should desire him. Maybe a little stoop shouldered fella. But when he come walking up to where he was, with, that father ran and said, Lord, I brought my son to your disciples, but they couldn't do anything for him. He said, will you help us? And he said, uh, I can if you believe. For all things are possible to man to believe. Yes. He said, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Brother, when that devil walked in the face of him, <laughs> he knew he met him on a different level than what them disciples had. They said, come out of him. And the boy fell and had the worst fit he ever had. And then he straightened out and stiffened. They said, he's dead. He said, he's not dead. Take him out. Disciples come along. He said, now listen, here's the modern day. Well, Lord, I guess you took all of our power away from us. The church don't have power anymore. No. So why couldn't we cast him out? said, because of your unbelief. Is that right? That's right. The church still has the power. You Methodist here, you got that power. You Baptists, Presbyterians, Nazarenes, Pilgrim Holiness, but you're afraid to use them. That's all. What good would it do for me to have a fine hunting gun laying on the wall afraid to shoot it? I'd never get any game, I'm sure. Well, I might make a whole lot of fizzles and have some back bars and not handload very good, Brother Gene. <laughs> but I'm shooting anyhow. <laughs> I'm trying off the heart. Yes, sir. So you will do that. Let's have faith and know that if we believe it, 
Amen. Amen. Let us bow our heads now. Lord Jesus, sometimes we talk like children and we're glad to be that. For if we know so much, you can't lead us no more. But as long as we're children, you forgive us of our ignorance and, and we just trust your hand. Sometimes we scream and shout and carry on because, Father, we're children. We, we, we don't depend on our own ability. We're just happy that we're, we have a Father that watches over us. We're so happy for this. Lord, there are people here that's sick, afflicted. Some of them are saved. Some are not saved. Some believe they're saved and not. Some are, they're just all kinds, Father. It's all mixed up. Will you help us tonight that we could have one, one great mammoth mass healing tomorrow? Grant it, Lord. May there be such an outpouring of your spirit. Lord, I pray that you'll just grant it in such a way till there will not be a feeble person left in the building. Grant it. Now we're going to open back the pages of the word. Now I can not open this book or no one can only physically with my hands. Let the Holy Spirit open it and interpret to us a few words that would build our faith in such a way that all of the unbelief would fade away from us and that we would be perfectly satisfied with a pure, unadulterated faith in God that He heals the sick, He saves the lost. And if there's any sin in our midst, Lord, take it away, please, Lord. And let us sanctify ourselves tonight through the uh, faith in the blood of Thy Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. We ask it in His name. Amen. I hear just talking to you, and it's time to close. I've got quite a few scriptures they got written down here. I'd like to refer to. I might not get to any of them, but for a way, a way of context, and I won't be too long. Honest, I hope I'm not. But I'm just uh, want to read from the book of Jeremiah, the eighth chapter, the twenty-second verse. This is a question of three letters I'm going to ask the audience tonight. Is there no bomb in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Then why is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? Now I'm going to ask the question like God did. Why? W-H-Y. Why? is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered. <clears throat> Pardon me. Now, that is quite a statement. But I believe that if God makes a way for anything, makes a way of escape, makes a way for it, and the people doesn't receive it, doesn't walk in it, then he has a right to ask why. If you went and bought your boy a car, you said, uh, uh, Junior, I, I do not want you to, to go to any pool rooms. Your father and mother, we are a Christian home. I don't want you smoking cigarettes. I don't want you going to dances with these modern uh, dances where they drink and things. We, we are Christians here, Junior, and you'll, you'll bring a reproach upon our home and upon the cause that we stand for. And I'll be real good to you, Junior. I'm, Daddy works hard, so I'm going to slave away till I save enough money to buy you a little car because you can go to school in it, you insist, and, and just be nice. I'll get you in nice clothes. And then you find out that Junior is smoking and drinking and going to places then you've got a right to ask that boy, why? Because you made every way for him to have pleasure and to take his little car and go fishing and, and so forth and go out riding. And, and then it, you'd have a right as a father to ask him, why? Why did you do it? Isn't that right, brother? Yes. Then if God made some way for his people to escape and get away from the wrath that's fixing to come and they don't receive it, then he's got a right to ask why didn't they do it? I landed in Bombay, India 
here some time ago. I was reading a piece in the paper. I still have it, or I beg your pardon. Tommy Nichols has it now. It's coming out in Christian Businessman's Voice. It said, the earthquake must be over. Now, India isn't rich people like they are in America. Now, the foreign people really think that as long as you're an American, you're rich. Well, that is right, according to them. But according to the status they have to live in. But uh, uh, they, uh, they have their fences where they pick up rocks, like we did in early America, make their fences. A lot of their homes are built out of rock and mud. But one day they come, a strange thing happened. And all the little birds that lived in these rocks along the fences and in the big towers all flew away from their nest and left it. Just evacuated their nest. And the cattle and sheep that when the day got hot they'd feed early by morning and late in the evening. But instead of, in, that, in the heat of the day, they'd come and stand in the shadows of this fence to keep cool. But instead of that, they run right out in the middle of the field and all leaned against one another. Cattle, sheep, animals. And the people wondered what strange action this is. Two days it happened. And all of a sudden an earthquake blew the country. Then walls fell in. The earthquake shot four or five different times for maybe two days. They had earthquake after earthquake. Finally, the little birds begin to fly back into their nest, the places that was left. The cattle come back around what walls was left. What was it? The same God that warned the birds and the animals to go into the ark for safety shows he is the same God today. He warned his animals to flee and to get away from those great walls that was fixed them to fall. Now, if God can do that by instinct to an animal, how much more should we who claim to be his children, filled with the Holy Ghost, be warned by the Spirit to flee these things of the world away from them? They're fixing to crumble in. Go to the ark of safety, which is Christ. Just as quick as you can get into him, go quickly. Don't wait a minute. For the hour is coming when the door will be closed and mercy will be no more. So if God has made a way, and then at the judgment, he's going to ask why. I used to know a song we sang. When the last book is open, what then? When the preacher has preached his last prayer, or prayed his last prayer, or something like that, the Bible's closed on the pulpit, the arms are all stacked, the taps sound out for its last times over the hill, the retreats are made, the sun's setting for its last time, the uh, uh, mimic has made his last act, and Hollywood is finished. What then? You're going to be asked to give a reason why you didn't come. Then what then? What's going to answer for? How are you going to escape it? Now we want to think these things seriously for about 30 minutes as I try to refer to some scriptures here. Now, you're going to be asked every one of you why. When it comes to a spot that when God has made every preparation set the Holy Spirit and revealed and showed everything that he promised in the Bible right before you, then what are you going to do? You know, it's something like the other day in Louisville, Kentucky, there was a woman had a little baby, and she was packing it around from place to place and was in a 10 cent store. And she'd say, look, darling, look, darling, look, darling. And, and she got hysterically. And after a while, she said, oh, you screamed out. And the people, the patrons and the the building began to notice that strange action of the woman, and she just fell across the table and said, begins crying. And when they wondered what was the matter with her, they went over. She said, my little boy here, two years old, said about six months ago, he just sat and stared. And said, I took him to the doctor. There's nothing that should attract a little boy like him will attract him. Said he just sits and looks blank. And said, I shake these little trinkets and things that ought to attract his attention, but he just sets blank. There's something wrong with him. 
Now, please forgive me if I, I don't mean to hurt feelings, but remember, this is where correction is. This is judgment. That's a whole lot like the church is today. God has shook all kinds of spiritual gifts before them, and they still sit like they were just staring. That's right. That's right. They don't know. You can speak against women wearing short hair. They never do anything about it. About wearing the immorally dressed. They never do anything about it. About uh, fussing in the denominations. One's better than this and this and this and this and this. They never do anything about it. They just go right on fussing. It's the same. I wonder what we're going to do at the judgment when God says, What? Amen. Sent an old Roberts of Tommy Hicks, spoke in tongues and interpretation of tongues and gave messages and prophets and everything else that he promised in the Bible, every blessing he shook it before the church, and constantly they lay on in unbelief. That's right. Then God will say, What? And what's your answer? Now, for, don't, don't think I'm trying to hurt, but what's that here in these wheelchairs? Yes. Look out there at the sickness. As many times as old Roberts and many great ministers of healing gifts and Jack Coles and things with that bulldog thing, grab your hold of it, and you've seen things done. Then he comes along with a prophetic gift and shows and deserves and playing foul proofs, world around. And they said, say, well, I wonder something could happen. God's going to ask you why. And you're going to have to answer. Yes, amen. Now, that's true. Yes. Now, one time there was a king. His name is Ahaza. He was the son of Jezebel and, and Ahab. And he took his father's place in Samaria when Ahab was killed according to the prophet's and the dogs licked his blood, uh, just exactly what the prophet uh, had said would take place. And Ahazah took his place. And he was a renegade, just like his father and his mother. And one day he was walking through the lattice of his house, perhaps the same lattice that the, that the Queen of Sheba or some other in her days that they, when they built the Temple of Solomon. And he, he fell through that lattice and hurt himself and got sick. And he sent up to Ikran to be Elzebub, a devil. Sent two men up there, a, a group of men, said, Go up and consult and ask Beelzebub, the god of, of Ikran, if I am going to get well, yes or no. And God sent an angel down to the old Elisha, sitting down there in a little cave door. He said, go up and meet him. God knows when to send and when not to. He said, go up and meet him and tell him, thus saith the Lord. And old Elijah walked sturdily up there and stood in the road when he seen him come up. He said, you're on your road over to the, to, to Akron, over there to meet, the, to meet the Beelzebub, to meet their prophets, to consult whether Ahaz is going to get well or not. He said, go back and tell him, why did you do that? Is it because there's no God in Israel? Is it because there's no prophet there? Why would you go to a thing like that then? Go tell him, thus saith the Lord. He's not coming off that bed. Oh my, that's God. What's the matter? That we change our papers from Methodist to Baptist to Presbyterian and all other different denominations and things running around? Why do we do these things? Why do we go? Why do we stay home on Wednesday night and watch We Love Susie or some of them plays and uh, television programs and things like that? Is it because there is no God in Pentecost? Come on. Is it because there's no joy in the house of the Lord? Is it because there's no prophet there? Is it because these things are not so? If there's no physician there, is there no bomb in Gilead? Bomb is healing. Then why is the daughter of my people still sick? That's why. Why do we do these things? Why do we act like the world? Why does our women still dress like the world? Why do our pastors?
pastors let deacons come in with two or three different wives and serve on the deacon boards. Why do we have to go just like the world and begin to act like the world and talk like the world? And, and why are we doing it? Is it because why do we have to great build shrines that's worth millions and millions of dollars and preaching Jesus is coming in the next few days? Missionaries on the field with no shoes on their feet living on one meal a day. Why would we throw our money away for stuff like that? And missionaries that I know have with no shoes on their feet. Man of God will answer for it someday. God's going to say, Why? That's right. That's right. That's right. Mother trying to hand you a little baby and his little belly swell that big dying for hunger. We try to want to keep up with the Joneses. God's going to ask us, why? Now, our great organizations building tens of millions of dollars worth of buildings and things like that, and preaching Jesus is coming soon. Our own testimony meets us in the face by the Word. No, we don't believe what we're talking about. Just become a routine around and around and around. The Father says so, we say it too. If you really believe it, act like it. If you believe in divine healing, accept Him. Yes. If you believe the Holy Ghost is right, stay up for 10 minutes until He comes. Amen. Don't take those substitutes. Stay there until the real thing's there. Well, you pass from death to life and the... Brother, the birds will sing different. Everybody, all the ones you hated, you love, and everything will be different when you do. Why don't we substitute something instead of it? God's going to say, why? And then we're going to have to answer. Now, that is right, brother. You believe that. All of you believe that. Amen. Now, that's, that's where we're standing. We should be a church on fire with faith, brother, burning. My, Instead of that, we're a little like a bunch of little coyotes backed up in the corner. Well, uh, yeah, I believe it. Uh -huh. You're backing up. Stand up there, toe to toe to it. Amen. We're the Pentecostal, be Pentecostal. Amen. We're not going to just break the thing down, consolidate with some other of our denominations. Our Methodist brethren, you're our Baptist brethren, our, Pente our Presbyterian, or won't you all go back and be Catholic? That's the oldest one of the bunch of them. Me? Go back and be that. But if we're a Pentecostal, let's be Pentecostal by experience. Rise. Shake yourself. Yes. Say, so go tell him what's the matter. Why would the Pentecostal people? A girl asked me the other day, said, Brother Bram, they're beginning to wear scandal skirts. I said, what's that? Oh, she said... The girls are wearing skirts that's cut down this way that shows their underskirt. Do you think it's wrong for a girl to do that? I said, Sister, what in the world does a Pentecostal Holy Ghost filled girl want to show her underskirt for? I would just like to ask you that. If she had been right with God, she wouldn't have had to ask that. Amen. I've got a little Bible. When I first started out, I wrote a little book. There could be somebody say, Is it wrong to smoke? Is it wrong to drink? Is it wrong to so and so? Like that. I said, Don't ask me foolish questions. Make this up in your mind. If you love the Lord with all your heart, you don't smoke, chew, or drink any shine. And that, I still stand by that. When the love of God's in your heart, you've got no time for nothing else. You're sold out. The Bible says if you love the world or the things of the world, it's because the love of God's not even in you. And your own life tells about it. Now, I hope that's plain enough. I won't have to get any plainer. Amen. But that's true. By their fruit, you know that. So shake ourselves. Let's be Pentecostal or, or to be something else. We're not Pentecostal. Let's quit saying we are. Until we get back to the real Pentecostal experience. Get back to faith. Daring faith. Them disciples seal their death with their faith. All faith of our fathers living still inside a dungeon flame or sword. 
That's what we want, real, genuine faith. You Methodists need it. You Baptists need it. You Pentecostals need it. All of us need it. God's going to say, why? Is there no bomb in Gilead? Is there no physician there? And why? Is there no is there no prophet in Israel? Is there no God there? Has Pentecostal lost their God? Don't they have any more gifts than amongst Pentecostal? Have they no more prophets, gifts of prophecy, prophets, teachers, pastors, evangelists? No one else to speak in tongues and give message? One thing you don't reverence them gifts enough. Another thing you don't prove them first. Then you get every kind of a spirit in there speaking. When you get that spirit and don't say something that's right, get it out of there. You don't want to substitute. God's got a real one for you. Some man speaks in tongues and let him, it's a message to the church. Everybody keep still. That's God speaking. And listen, see if it's not to the church, then it's in the flesh. If it's something to the church and it doesn't come to pass, then that's a foul, evil spirit because God won't lie. That's the truth. That's right. And you'll have your church setting in order. See? But the way it is, just let it fly loose anywhere and somebody chewing, chewing gum, another eating popcorn, one talking, another whispering, somebody trying to speak in tongues three or four at a time and, and this and trying. Oh, my. That's right. It becomes a Corinthian affair again. We ought to get it back in order, back with the Holy Spirit. Oh, let it test that gift. You say, oh, Brother Brandon, if we test that, to, well, brother, it has to be tested right here, don't it? Yes. <laughs> That's right. Don't be afraid of it's God. It's right. One hundred percent right. Amen. Yeah. Glory. But you plumb over the top of that. I was talking to the man, uh, the editor, Bob. What's his name? Lots of Christian life, and he's down at uh, Schuler, no, not Bob Schuler. He's the Methodist brother. I know him real well, but I can't think of his name. It writes the Christian Life, the uh, Walker. He come to Indianapolis, and he said, Brother Branham, what about the Pentecostals? He said, they do this and do that. I said, and what about the rest of them? They do the same thing. But many times their members are in the paper, they're out, the editors of the paper, and they should don't hear about it. But I said, well, they do just as bad. But I said, sometimes somebody does get off of the wrong end. And then what do you all do? You jump from across the real thing and pour over to that. And this over on this side that's real wildfire, a part come back over to old coal farm. I said, it's right in the middle of the road goes the genuine Holy Ghost. The church going. Them old coal farmers on one side and radics on the other side is off falls from the real thing. Isaiah said in 35th chapter, there shall be a highway. You Nazarenes call it the highway of holiness. You're wrong. Not disputing your word. But said there shall be a highway and, and's a conjunction. That's right. Uh, there shall be a highway and a way and it shall be called, not the highway, but the way of holiness. Yes, the middle of the road. Dr. Weed. I know you silly, brother. No, he's a darling brother, a precious friend of mine. I was preaching on that one time. Brother Weed got up and said, you know what, Brother Vibbert, I guess all of you know Brother Vibbert, he's my cousin, he's big assemblies at the, at the Evansville, Indiana. We had in the man's meeting on the other side, he said, he said, Brother Bram talked about the um, uh, middle of the road, he said, that's not good driving ethics. So I had to be standing behind me, didn't know it. I said, you see, Brother Weed, just how earthly you can get, you assembly brother. <laughs> <laughs> he's a precious brother. And... The Sim is one of my great sponsors. So I said, you see, you just think about the earthly things so much and get in such a twist that all you can think about is just the things of the earth. I said, sure, right here on earth, that's bad ethics. But this road I'm talking about, you don't come back. It's just a one-way ticket. <laughs> <laughs> How many knows Roy Wee? He, he's one of the finest men that you can get. He's been a real brother to me. And uh, so there you are. But God's going to ask us why. He asked the king why. Now, it wasn't because they didn't have a prophet that he could consult. No, no. No, sir. He could have went and consulted the prophet of God. It wasn't because there was no God in Israel. Sure, the God of Israel would have told the prophet. 
about it, the king. But it was the king's own stubborn way. And that's what's the matter with the nations today in the world. It's not because we haven't got a God, but science is trying to rule him out of the picture. And the people are too stubborn to stand up on the principles of God's Word. Exactly right. They say, oh, that's a bunch of holy rollers. Let it be whatever it may be. I've been, I've traveled the world over several times. I've never seen a holy roller yet. Amen. I've looked at these 969 different organizations and churches recorded in Washington, and there's not a one of them called Holy Rollers. That's a dirty name that the devil put on the church. There's no such a thing as Holy Roller. No such an organization is called Holy Rollers. They call anybody who believes in holiness Holy Rollers. And if without holiness, no man shall see God. So you see where the essence of it comes from. Yeah. All right. The king, he was just stubborn. He didn't want to listen to the prophet. They had a prophet. They had God. But the, the king was too stubborn. That's the way it is today. People are too selfish. They talk about divine healing. They'd rather lay out there and die than even to admit they believed in divine healing. People would rather... It's just like a man dying on a doctor's doorstep because he won't take his medicine. The doctor's got the toxin for the disease he's got. And the man will sit on the doorstep. The doctor's got plenty of toxin, but he won't take it. He's too stubborn to go in and take it. He'll die. And he ought to. So then, if he feels that way about it, it's not because the doctor... Don't lay it on to the doctor. If the doctor's got the toxin and willing to give it, and the patient sitting on the doorstep is too stubborn to come in to take it, don't lay it on to the doctor. It's not the doctor's fault, neither is it the toxin. It's the patient's fault. It won't take it. The same thing it is in the church. We've got plenty of bomb in Gilead. And we got physicians here. But people die in the pews in sin without the Holy Ghost because they're too stubborn to come to it. And they're afraid it'll hurt their social prestige. It'll break them down. Might cost a little of their card parties and things. Afraid they might cut up a little and act unruly. <laughs> No, don't blame the doctor. Don't blame the remedy. Just blame the patient for not taking the remedy. That's where it's at. We got toxin. We got plenty. The world's full of the Holy Ghost. This is everywhere. We got physicians, brother, that knows how to give the medicine. But the, the people won't take it. Oh, they say, I'm Presbyterian. That don't mean no more than a hog would be a, able to wear a side saddle in a stable level racehorse. That don't have nothing to do with it. Has nothing to do with it. Presbyterian, Methodist, Baptist, or Pentecostal organization or anything else don't mean that to God. You must be born again. Dying in the church pews. Not because there's no toxin, plenty of toxin, but it's because they refuse to take it. Now, you know what? If you refuse to take the doctor's medicine, it's dangerous. You might die if you don't take the doctor's toxin. You might die. And that's dangerous to not take it. Like the salt vaccine. Like the smallpox. When I go overseas, I, I, they, they, they give me so many shots that I look like a guinea egg to get into the places where they, this uh, shot, uh, shots with yellow fever and, and all kinds of toxins. They say, I keep you from taking it. I didn't want to take it, but you have to take it anyhow. So that's why you say, Brother Bram, do you believe in medicines? Well, sure. Certainly, they're God-given things. We believe that. But that ain't what heals you. What if we didn't have health and hygiene? What would we have? The way the people is accumulated on earth today and how many things? If the hospital is not of God, then burn the thing down and say, Antichrist. <laughs> See? Sure, but it is of God, but they don't do no healing. They're just a place to keep you away and to help you and try to keep you clean while... You if you're ever healed, God heals you. Famous doctor, I wouldn't call his name. He said to me, he said, Billy, you come in here and the first thing he said, a horse doctor has to have more sense than we do. He said, he has to know where the horse is sick at. He said, he come in and say, what's the matter with you? He said, you tell me what's wrong. He said, I'm in a hurry. I'll write you a little prescription. He said, you notice whose name's on there? The druggist, he paid for this. 
So I'll charge you ten dollars, you go over and get it filled, he'll go back and fill it and charge you three dollars for something he paid two cents for. Said you take it for three or four days, says the Lord hasn't healed you, but that time you come back to my office, I'll charge you five dollars more, say go and get it repeated again. <laughs> there you are. It's God that heals. Now I'm not condemning a good doctor, God knows that. Now I say this one thing, let me stop a minute. I have found more doctors believing in divine healing than I have preachers. Right. I went from hospital to hospital. A famous doctor had me go to an old man the other day, an old doctor that I don't have got time to tell you, that was 80 years old, been unconscious for two weeks. Brother Goldier knows of the case. He had to the same club, shooting club that I just went into a few days ago. And that old doctor was laying there, and a famous, one of the best doctors there is in the South, said, Brother Brandon, when you come over and just have a word with the old man, you've been unconscious. And while I was holding his hand, he came to me and said, Hello, doctor. I said, I'm not a doctor. I said, I'm Brother Branham. He said, well, hey, I must have been asleep here yeah, about three weeks. <laughs> I said, I guess, doctor, how long have you been practicing medicine? He said, how old are you? I said, 52 years old. He said, before you were nursing. <laughs> and I said, I guess so many nights you've had a flashlight down along the creek banks, the old country doctor, down along the creek banks trying to find uh, some baby with a belly ache or a mother in labor. And he said... Not a flashlight, a lantern. <laughs> and uh, I said, I guess you then you didn't get nothing for it. Maybe a set of eggs or something. So no, I didn't expect nothing. And I said, well, you know what I think, Doc? You believe in God. He said, I wouldn't be here if I didn't. And I said, you know what I think? I said, over in the glory land, they must have a little place over the corner where all them good old doctors that's helped so many times. He started crying. I said, now I'm getting excited. He said, no, 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 stay right here. Doctors, my doctor stand there, a friend of mine stand there, wringing his hands, crying, standing back in the corner. Afterwards, he said, I never see anything like it in my life. He said, what did you do to him? I said, I never done one thing but put my hand on him. God-fearing old man. He said, no. I held his hand. I said, guess you poor performer many operations, doc. He said, I never picked up a knife before I asked my creator to help me and guide it. I said, you may be 86 years old, but if I had to have operation, I want them same hands to perform it. That's right. I said, there must be a little place over there in heaven where he He said, Brother Bram, you think you'll let me in? I said, I think so. He started crying. I hugged him up. Here he was down on range of the day. A big old musket standing there. said, watch me hit that target, boys. He's back practicing, 86 years old. That's right. Oh, yes. They got real man in there. And they got some renegades too. And don't holler at them because we got some others, renegades, that call themselves reverend. That's, right. That's exactly right. So, sauce for the goose is for the gander. Yes, sir. A man's got toxin and, and salt vaccine for these little children, not polio. I pray daily that God will send us something for cancer. If we can't have faith, let's get something else. Faith is the first. Let's take the next best. If we can't get that, look at the world and the conditions in poor suffering humanity. Help everybody you can. Everything that helps is of God. Let's help. Let's do everything we can and pray for man. The thing to do, brother, is get our arms together, both medicine, doctors, hospitals, nurses, church, and all together, and put our faith in God and more forward. That's what we need. God's going to ask us why we didn't do it some of these days. You remember Luke was a doctor too. Now, God never for, condemned him for being a doctor, but you remember he wrote the great stories of healing. It was surprising to him to see what God could do. And he was the one who wrote them. Former th- uh, treatise of Ethiopius I have wrote to you and so forth like that. Uh, Jesus and Nazareth, what they all begin to do and say. He knew what Jesus was. Now, people dying in the pew because they refuse the remedy. Uh, it is a serious thing to refuse that. But how much more serious is it to refuse God's bomb? What is God's bomb? The Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. That's the cure for sin. You might refuse the toxin of the doctor, and you might go ahead and live an ordinary uh, hour, or week or two, or die and go on. You might do that. You might shorten your days. But if you fuse God's toxin, you'll die eternally. You'll be completely separated from God in mercy for eternity. 
So don't you never... Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Then what's the matter with the daughter of my people that they can't believe in divine healing no more? Is it because it's not taught? No. Well, what's the matter then? What's the matter with the baptism of the Holy Ghost? To quit teaching? No. God, did people get it? Yeah. Well, is there plenty of balm? Whosoever will, let him come. Drink from the fountain, gushing fountain of the Holy Spirit, calling whosoever will, physicians stand there to pass you to it. And why don't you come? Then God said, why? Why didn't you? What are you trying to do, Brother Branham? Shake a faith into a people that they'll realize. Is there no bomb in Gilead? Now I want to ask you something. The reason they dodge the issue is because they're afraid of the new birth. That's what it is. Oh, we Americans are so stylish, you know. Oh, my. So much we just got to put on the what we call the dog, you know. Everybody's got to just be like the Joneses. They got, I hope there's no Joneses here. If there is, I don't mean it to them. But that's just an American expression. Um... Like or Doe, John Doe, I'll say. They got to be like that. We, we got to be so classic. They're afraid of the new birth. Let me tell you, brother. They say, oh, one time I was out there preaching and there's a boy from a certain church that I used to belong to come up and said, Billy, you know what? I was enjoying your message so much until that woman got up back there and began to scream and cry and then she got all them people started crying. Oh, I said, that excites you? He said, well, I couldn't hear what she was saying. And I said, that, it was all right up to that time. I said, oh, she's just rejoicing. I said, oh, that just made chills run up my back. And I said, brother, if you ever get to heaven, you'll freeze to death. <laughs> Let me tell you. I said, because even the angels in heaven is screaming with wings over their face and over their feet, day and night, holy, holy, holy unto the Lord. Holy, holy, holy. I said, you're living in the quietest world you ever lived in. If you go to hell, there'll be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. If you go to heaven, there'll be glory, holy, holy, holy unto the Lord, day and night. The quietest place you ever lived. He happened to play on a Colgate's baseball team. And he said, well, I don't, they don't do that in my church. I said, well, that, I hope you don't think yours is a pattern. And uh, so he said, well, I said, he said, well, that don't look very much like a Christian to me when a minister speaking to say, I said, you know what? That encourages me. Hear him say, amen. And so be it. I said, I used to have an old dog. And I said, he'd take anything but a skunk. And I said, I'd, I'd get him a tree on her brush pile. And the only thing I had to do is get him to get that skunk. I didn't want it myself. So and I, that's how I got my school clothes was, was trapping and hunting and and I get this skunk out of the brush pile, and old Fritz would stand there. The only thing I had to do, get him going there, raise up the pile, and he'd get back and look at me like that. Then, Master, you're not going to run me under there, are you? I said, go get him, boy. Sick him, sick him, sick him, boy. Go get him. he go get him. I said, the devil's the biggest skunk I know of. <laughs> when I hear people saying, that's right, amen. We got him treed then, brother. We'll get him pretty soon. <laughs> Just let him go. <laughs> yes. Yes, that's right. We got, amen. I said, look, I heard you the other night when Charles Nolan knocked that home run. I don't live very far from the park. I said, not over by five blocks. I said, I never heard such a noise in all of my life. He said, oh, Billy, you ought to have been there. I said, there's three men on base, and you know Charles went to school with him. I said, sure. He said, he knocked the home run. and said, man, I'm telling you, you ought to see them slide in. I said, you unholy rollers down there? I couldn't even sleep for you. <laughs> unholy rollers. I said, if we're holy rollers, then you're unholy rollers. See? I said, that. I said, you'd be a poor basketball fan. So they'd say, oh, yeah, see, hit the home run. I said, you'd say he wasn't very much enthused. He's knocking straw hats down over one another's head and slapping one another and shaking and everything like that. I said, when the preacher gets in the pulpit and hits one of them home runs like that and see the saints open up the way and see heaven, they holler, glory, glory, I'll see it, I'll see it, hallelujah, hallelujah. I said, they just start the king's highway, that's all. There it is, see. Yes. 
Oh, yes, they, it's strange how they miss it, but I guess it's just to be that way. It's all cut out by God, and I guess he, that's the way it's supposed to be. Now, how does a doctor ever find what kind of medicine to work on a person with? Yes, they're afraid of the new birth. You know what? The reason they're afraid of the new birth, because, listen, excuse me, my sisters, will you? I'm, I, it's a mixed audience, but you listen to your doctor, I, I'm your brother. Any birth is a mess. I don't care where it's at. If it's in the pig pen, in the barnyard, or if it's in the pink decorated hospital room, it's a mess. And the new birth is too. <laughs> it'll make you squall and bawl and wash all that paint off your face. It, yeah. It'll do things for you that you didn't think you would do. You'll carry on like you never did think you would do. It's a mess. But you know, before you can be born, you have to die. And some people die awful hard. <laughs> they kick and bawl and scream and carry on. But unless a corn of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. Yeah. If you want to bring forth fruit, die to yourself in your own man-made theology and be born again of the Spirit of the Get rid of that old spirit of selfishness and dryness that's in you. Take on new life. It's messy. Unless a grain of corn falls in the ground and rots. Unless a man rots to his own theology. Unless you rotten to Methodist theology. Unless you rotten to Baptist theology. Unless you rotten to Pentecostal theology. Until you rot to those things and give yourself into the hands of God. All right. Then the old man will die and the new man will be born in Christ Jesus. And you will rise. What's the matter? Yes, there's where it's at. How do they get medicine? You know how they get medicine? Uh, they take a guinea pig and they work up some kind of stuff, medicine, and think this ought to do a certain thing, and they shoot it into a guinea pig. And if he survives it, they'll give it to you. You know, everybody ain't made like a guinea pig. You know, sometimes the medicine will kill you. There's been about as many killed with penicillin as there has been healed or helped. So, you know, everybody ain't made alike. So it'll help some and kill the others. Because all men ain't made up like guinea pigs. But, you know, it'll help some and kill the others. But there's one thing sure. God's toxin will hurt no one but cure all. That's right. For he said, whosoever will. It won't kill you. It'll heal you. Oh, heal the broken hearted. Lift up those feeble hands. God, joy. Take a little washwoman so bad that she can't even talk to the insurance man that comes to the door and let her get filled with the Holy Ghost. She can give a testimony or shake her shingles off the house. She's got something. Something's happened to her. She's born in the Spirit of God. Take the honorest prostitute that ever walked the street out here. The dogs wouldn't even look at her. That's right. Let her come in and get cleaned up from God. She'll be a crack any neighborhood. Amen. Right. That's what the grace of God does. Amen. Don't whitewash, but it washes white. That's right. Make her gun barrel straight. I believe in an old time backwood sky blue sin killing religion. Yes, sir, that kills out sin and self, and you're born again to the Spirit of God and live for Him. Amen. That's the kind that saves you, brother. Sometimes I go back down in the state of Kentucky. You know what? Them Baptists down there in the state of Kentucky would make some of us Pentecostals feel ashamed. They said, Brother Brad, you said you was a Baptist. Yeah, I was a real Baptist, though. We didn't walk up and take the right hand of fellowship. Brother, we got out the altar and beat one another in the back till we come through. <laughs> We got up there, we had something. Amen. The other day in California, I was in a great church, one of our great Pentecostal churches, and made an altar call, and three or four people come to the altar, and I begged for five minutes to get somebody to come pray with them sinners. 
I sort of tore out more. I couldn't hardly stand up from preaching. And I, I said, well, somebody come pray. Just sat there just as starch as at Pentecostal church. Well, then Baptist there, make a machine. I was preaching down there on Decoration Day, way back up there in the holler, and old horses were eating corn all around, dinner on the ground, foot washing, you know, and stand out there preaching, preaching on, we shall rise, hallelujah, we shall rise on that resurrection morning. I said, there lays my old grandmother. I held her in my arms, 110 years old, when she threw her arms around my neck, said, God bless your little soul, honey, dying forevermore, I'll meet you in heaven. About that time, my old aunt standing back there with a big old long bonnet on. She said, Hallelujah! Here she come. Like that. An old sinner boy standing there with a big old limb bark hat in his hand like that. He said, God be merciful to my soul. And here he come down the altar. Before he got there, there's about 20 of those old mammies around him. We got saved before he got the altar, brother. <laughs> you know what time we eat dinner? About 4.30 that afternoon. Brother, they stayed there until they come through. Oh, used to be old cold formal Baptist. Now it's old cold formal Pentecostals. That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yes, they give the little guinea pig a noxine, toxine. Give it to him. If he makes it, then they give it to you. It won't work. But you know, when God got ready to try his toxine out, he didn't give it to a guinea pig. He gave it to himself. Amen. That's right. God became flesh and dwelt among us in order to try the toxin on himself. Any real good doctor will try it on himself before he gives it to his patient. Right. And God, that's the reason he had to become flesh. Jehovah was a spirit. God is a God the Father is a spirit. God the Son is a man who the Spirit of God dwelt in. We all know that. So then when God came down and made flesh so he could take the toxin. So on the banks of the Jordan. He taken the injection himself. The greatest thing that ever happened. When earth and heaven kissed. When the lamb and dove come together. The dove, the meekest bird of the heaven. God, Jehovah, represented himself, represented himself in the meekest bird of the air, the dove. God the Son, which was Jesus Christ, represented himself in the meekest animal. A lamb and a dove that are both the same nature. What if that dove would have fell down on the wolf and said, Days of miracles is past. The dove went zoot. Right. Sure. The first time the wolf snorted, no one of them big tempers, you know, they got like that. I'll tell you right now, if you don't blow tonight. Uh-uh. The dove don't stay there. The dove is meat. The lamb is leg. The lamb don't have but one thing to offer. That's wool. I heard someone tell me, said, woman said, it's my American privilege if I want to smoke cigarettes. I said, that's exactly right. Said they sell it. I said, that's exactly right. But if you are a lamb, you forfeit your rights. But if you're a goat, you won't do it. <laughs> you just do whatever you want to. Yeah. It's your rights, but you forfeit it for the kingdom of God's sake. That's right. You forfeit all your rights. Kingdom of God's sake, forfeit it. Certainly. Now, we find out that God took the anoxine himself, the toxin. He was inoculated. They watched him through life. When they spit in his face, he said nothing about it. When they put an old dirty rag around his head and hit him on top of the head, said, Now, if you're a prophet, tell us who hit you. And we'll, he never opened his mouth. They jerked handfuls of beard out of his face till it was bleeding. They put a crown of thorn on his face. He said, I could speak to my father. He had sent me 20 legions of angels. But my kingdom's not of this world. The toxin held in a time of temptation. They took him on the cross and let him thirst up there and die, bleed till his human body run dry. Toxin hell. He riled not back when he was riled on. That's the kind of toxin. Everybody was, the world was watching it. The disciples was watching it. Then they seen him until finally when he come to the last hour, what was they? Oh, I was wrong. I was wrong. Take me off. I'll join your churches. I'll believe your theology. He said, into thy hands I command my spirit. Father, it's finished. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Father, the toxin helped, brother. The toxin helped. Then they buried him. Some of them said this imposter said that he had raised on the third day. Let's make sure. So they took a hundred men, rolled a big rock up against the door, and put Caesar's seal up on it. Burn up, Rickett. What's going to happen? Where's the toxin at now? Glory to God on Easter morning, it proved what it was. Amen. <laughs> It broke the seal of Caesar. It broke the seal of death. It broke the seal of the grave. It 
broke the seal of hell. It rose out again. Hallelujah. Triumph over death, hell, and the grave. God's toxin hell. There's 120 people said, I want to get inoculated too. I want that kind of inoculation. Don't you want that? Jesus said, the same inoculation I've got, you'll have it also. It'll work on you just like it does on me. The works that I do shall you also if you just get inoculated with this toxin that I'm not. Well, you say that's wrong. Oh, wait, it isn't either. Two come to him and said, Lord, let my, one of my sons sit on your right hand where he said, can you drink the cup that I drink? Can you be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? said, yes. In other words, inoculated with inoculation I'm inoculated with? said, yes. said, you will. But the right and left hand's not mine. That belongs to the Father to give that. But said, you shall be inoculated. In other words, receive the same that I have got. Now, wouldn't you like to have that inoculation? Wouldn't that be fine to know that in life you could live that life? In life these signs would follow you. In death you could say, Father, it's finished. Into the hands I command my spirit. Oh, my. Then on the resurrection morning, glory to God, they might patch in the face with a shovel. But on that resurrection morning, you'll come forth again, brother, inoculation. Oh, they saw a help in the hour of death. It helped in temptation. It helped in the sickbed. It helped in the grave. It held in hell. It held on Easter. And there was 120 desired that inoculation. So they went up to the upper room to wait for their inoculation. Amen. Jesus said, I'll send the serum down just as soon as you get up there and wait. Oh, I begin to feel real religious, honestly. Glory! You're going to call me a holy roller anyhow. You might as well get started. You think Baptists don't shout? Here's one that does. I believe it. Amen. Yes, brother. Hallelujah. Climbed them up the rooms and waited for the inoculation to come. All of a sudden, there came the serum from heaven. Is there no bomb in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Here come the inoculation down. The medical kit for healing. For he was wounded for our transgressions. He was wounded for our iniquity. Taxed of our peace is up on him with the stripes that he was healed. Hallelujah! The symptoms of that death on Calvary sent back the inoculation to the church for the commission going to all the world. Preach the gospel. These signs shall follow them that's inoculated. There came a sound from heaven like a rushing mighty wind, inoculated 120. How did they act? Just like a Brandon cat. Brother, here's one. Staggered under the impact of that inoculation. Brother, they were so drunk on the spirit till the people thought they were crazy. They said, These men are full of new wine. Peter said, Full of new wine. Got up and began to preach to them. Now, the first thing you know, they said, we would like to have some of this inoculation. They seen something real. That's right. That's right. The hungry-hearted church members saw something real. Something that actually those people had is making them act like that. Yes. They seen that they had something because they looked like they were drunk and yet they were religious. And yet they had signs. Called. Said, well now, uh, have you got a doctor here? <laughs> Is there any doctor here? He said, yeah, we got one here, Dr. Simon Peter. Come forth, Dr. Simon Peter. Tell him the prescription. <laughs> so what can we do to be saved? What can we do to get the inoculation? Uh, Peter said, well, you must take the caution. <laughs> you must get a right hand of fellowship. <laughs> must be tried for six months first to see whether it really works or not. <laughs> oh, mercy. That's man-made theory. Peter said, Repent every one of you. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the Holy Spirit. Amen. Follow up. You brother said, I'm giving you an eternal prescription. Yes. Dr. Peter gave him a Dr. Simon Peter on the day of Pentecost gave us an eternal prescription. That's right. Not join hands, shake hands, sprinkle. He said, Repent. Not come into the church, but he said, Repent, everybody. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is that in you and to your children, this prescription goes whosoever will lay That's it. Is there no bomb in Gilead? Sure. Is there no positions there? Certainly. 
That's right. That's why my people still sick as <laughs> hell. Oh, you know what's the matter? You get a real doctor that'll write out a prescription, and you take it down to some quack druggist, and he goes to mixing that prescription and something else, he'll kill the patient. <laughs> exactly right. That's what's the matter. We got too many quack seminaries. Let's try to make something else. Join the church. Your mother belongs here. Put your name on the book. Brother, don't you tamper with that prescription. You give it just like the doctor wrote it. Yeah. Hallelujah. And the same results will come. Yeah. If you'll follow the prescription. Don't divvy from it. Now remember, prescription has so much poison in it. Then it has enough antidote to upset that poison. Enough poison, he diagnoses your case. And then he gives you enough poison to kill the germ, enough antidote to upset it so it won't kill you. Right. And if you put all antidote, it won't help you. Put all poison, it'll kill you. Right. So it has to be a balanced prescription. And God the doctor knows how to give it to Simon Peter, and he wrote it, and he said, this prescription is for you, your children, and to them as far as many as the Lord Now you say Pentecost is not right. What's the matter? What kind of a drug store are you going to? That's what's the matter. We got card parties in the church, bunk code games to pay the preacher. Selling old rooftop top roosters, bought them up about selling for a dollar and a half a plate to pay the preacher. Him standing up there and talk about flowers and things and never preach the baptism of the Holy Ghost. What's the matter, brother? That's the reason we got sickness. That's the reason we got people that don't believe in divine healing. It's because they haven't put the right prescription. Amen. Amen. You get the baptism of the Holy Ghost and you'll believe in God's power. You'll believe every word God says. You'll punctuate it with an amen to everything that God says. And then people didn't sit there and say, Well, Simon, I suppose I must be all right. Brother, when they got that, they were filled with the Holy Ghost. They get a scatter all the And remember, you Catholic person, the Blessed Virgin Mary was right there. And if God would let her come to heaven without she took that same prescription, how are you going to get there anything less? Some of you cold starch Pentecostals, you cold starchy Baptists, you cold starchy Methodists, how are you going to get there anything less than that when even the mother of Jesus Christ had to go up there and get the same thing and stagger and act like she was drunk? That ain't the Bible. I'll ask any professor to come disprove it. And every time in the Bible they ever got the Holy Ghost, they acted exactly the way they did there. Yeah. The prescription will take the same effect on every time. Amen. Hey man, what time is it? Oh, I thought it was 7 o'clock. Oh, brother. Listen, brother. Listen, sister. What the world needs today is to see something real. That's what they're looking for, to see something real. I mean the real born again. Now them kind that was ordained the eternal life will see it. My sheep hear my voice. Exactly that's right. You say, well, yes, we are Presbyterian. Now, are we Methodist? We, I don't care what you are. If you hear the real voice of God and the real voice of God made them people act like that and do like that and have a ministry like that, the same power of God will do the same thing today if you've got it. That's right. If you received it, it'll act on you like it did them. Yeah. Certainly it is. Peter said this prescription is for all generations. So you people who are making up a bunch of man-made dogma and call it doctrine, calling creeds, church creeds, Presbyterian, Methodist, Baptist, and even Pentecostal creeds, what's the matter with you? Take God's prescription. That's the reason the children are sick. Yeah, haven't got the prescription fulfilled yet. God's got plenty of bomb now. Don't worry about that. You just obey the prescription and see what happens. Repent and see if the Holy Ghost will come. Do as God said do and see if the Holy Ghost will come. See if it will take the same effect it did. What's the matter today, friend? We've got to really have it. That's what God said. Something real. While I'm talking about real, let me close. Will you give me five more minutes? I like to hunt. I just love to hunt. Just to get and see the sunsets and get in the woods. 
As all of you know, my mother's a half-breed. My mother's mother comes to the reservations, draws a pension, see. So, we, my conversion never took it out of me, the love of the woods. A Christian businessman, full gospel. They take me on the river, no return. Around the world, a hunt in Africa, Asia, the mountains. Bud Branham, the Rainy Pass Lodge at Anchorage. That's my cousin, see. And 16 planes going in for grizzly sheep and so forth. You hunter brothers and so forth. You ever go up there, let me ride him and he'll get you in there cheap, see. So, um, and I get to go up there and hold meetings and they take me in for nothing because I don't have any money, so... And that's why the reason I don't have to have any money if the Lord wants to send me to Africa, he'll say, Brother Branham, somebody come up and say, the Lord said to give you this. I say, thank you, Lord. I know that's <laughs> See, I don't have to beg for nothing. The Lord won't want me go, then he'll keep me here. See, just, that's the way to live. I love to live that way. Just what he says. All right. I ain't got, got nothing. Don't want nothing. So I just want his grace is all. I used to hunt up in the North Woods. I had a hunting partner up there, and you, all you brethren that hunt know what a good hunting partner is. You know one another. He was one of the finest hunters and the best shots I ever seen. You never had to worry about him. Sometimes you take a, a chichocker in the woods, and, and you get a uh, chichocker, that means greenhorn, and it's an Indian word. But you take him into the woods, and you just have to keep an eye on him to get him lost. But you never had to worry about old Bert. He knew where he was at. He's about a half Indian himself. So he was a fine fellow, but the meanest man I ever seen in my life. He was a cruel heart, this guy. He used to shoot little fawns just to make me feel bad. Now, I don't think it's wrong to shoot a fawn. If the conservation says for you to shoot a fawn, that's all right. Abraham killed a calf and fed it to God. So the fawn part's all right, but not just to be mean. It's, it's not what you do, it's the way you do it. So sometimes it's not what you say, it's the way you say it. And so then uh, this, um, this little fawn, he had seen them little fawns and he knew me being a minister, you know. He'd just shoot them little fellows, eight or ten of them a year, just to make me feel bad. And I said, Bert, you are one of the finest buddies and I like to hunt with you because you're a good fella, but you are so mean. He said, you call me mean? I said, you're more than that, you're wicked. And he said, ah, oh, preacher, get next to yourself. He said, you're chicken hearted like the rest of preachers. I said, I'm not chicken hearted. But I said, man, they, I'm a hunter. And I said, I, I don't, I'm not a killer. I'm a hunter. And he said, ah, get next to yourself, Billy. One year up there, he said, I went up. I was a little late getting up there. The season's been open a couple weeks. And oh, if anybody ever hunted the North Woods, them white tails. Oh, brother. Talk about who'd eat the escape artist. They, and he, he's an amateur to them when they're shot at a couple times. They just, just like that. And sometimes you can't see over 20 feet away from in them woods there in Maine where you, you, you better know where you're at or you'll never come back. For hundreds of miles, it's just level and you fall in the marsh and go over your head 10 times. And, and it's just dangerous hunting. If you're not a real woodsman, stay out of it unless you got somebody with you. So we were out there hunting and we, and before we went out, my wife was with me and she stayed up at the lodge, up the camp. There's about 20 women up there. So Bert and I always take them across the other side of the mountain and we knew where we were at and was hunting. And he said, I got something, Billy. I said, what is it, Bert? He reached down his pocket and he had a little whistle. He could blow it and sound like a little fawn crying. That's a baby deer, you know, crying for its mammy. And I, oh, I said, Bert, you're not that cruel. Well, you would, would you call a doe up with that fawn call? He said, ah, get next to yourself. I didn't really think he'd do it, honest. We hunted, there's about six inches of snow on the ground, about good hunting weather tracking. We hunted all the way till noon, didn't find a thing, not even a track. There's them deer's feet at night, and then in the daytime they get back under the bushes and things, you can't move them. And so they won't move till it gets night again, unless you happen to step on one and get him out. So then uh, we hunted about 11 o'clock, 11.30, and we always packed... Uh, a thermos bottle full of hot chocolate and maybe a sandwich and we'd climb up as far as we could and then at noon time we'd eat and then separate and he'd go another way and me another way and we'd come back to the spike camp for that night come in maybe 10 or 11 o'clock at night so then uh, he has come to a little opening about the size of this uh, auditorium in here and he just kind of is in front of me so he just kind of hunkered down like this uh, hunker I guess that's all right here isn't it? enough Kentuckians here know what I mean when I say hunker so just kind of stooped down brother and um, he reached back in his pocket like this and he was going to get the, go to get his uh, I thought he was getting his sandwich out and when he did he brought out that little whistle and I looked at him and I said oh shame on you Bert he blowed it and it sounded just exactly like a little baby crying for its mother and when he did I looked just across the place and a great big doe stood up. And he had eyes just like a lizard. And 
He looked at me them lizard eyes like that, and I said, Oh, you wouldn't do that, Bert. I said, She, that's a mother, brother. I said, That's a mother. She thinks that's her baby. He said, Oh, get next to yourself, preacher. Slipped around like this with his gun. I thought, Oh, my. And he blew it again. I could just see them great big eyes and big ears sticking out like that doe, the mother deer. She'd probably had fawns, you see. So her baby was in trouble. She's listening, and big ears up. And so he blew it again. Now that's altogether unusual that time of day, 11 o'clock in the day. So she stepped right out into this opening. Now that's altogether unusual if anybody hunts deer. Walked right out into that opening. What was the matter? She was looking for her baby. She was looking around like that. Now she wasn't playing a part of a hypocrite. She had something in her. She was born a mother. And her baby was in trouble. She was looking for that baby. Just then, I see old Bert. We never carry a shell in the in the barrel, and that's bad policy. So I see him take this thirty off six and put a that hundred and eighty grain mushroom bullet, oh a dead shot, pull that clip down, raise it up like that, and then crosshairs and that scope right across her heart. Oh God, how can that man do that? That mother looking for her baby, and then he'd be cruel enough to blow that precious loyal heart plumb through her while across this building with that. Using that heavy load of shell he was, why oh, he'd blow her heart plumb out of her. I thought, how can he be that mean? Just to that precious mother, that loyal heart, looking for her baby. Out looking for her baby, and then him shoot her heart out of her. I thought, Bert, you're wicked. And he looked down, I see him moving down like this and setting himself, and oh, brother, I know what was going to happen. I couldn't look at it. And in the, when I turned around to see what he was doing, the deer spotted the hunter, and she spooked that, that's a hunter's word, that means she got scared, and she, she looked up, she threw the big ears up like that, did she run? No, sir. Death or no death, her baby was in trouble. She was looking for her. Oh, my. She couldn't help it. She was a mother. She was born a mother. She wasn't playing the part of a hypocrite. She was a mother, dead or no death. That baby was in trouble and she was looking for it. And I thought, surely that ought to strike that cruel hearted man. I see him leveling himself, getting ready to shoot. I turned my back. I couldn't look at it. I just couldn't stand it. See that precious mother go to get that precious loyal heart that she loved her baby so much until she was going to have it blow plumb out of her. Look, and looking at what a hunter was sitting there too. And know that meant death to her. But she was hunting her baby. I turned around and I thought, oh God, oh how can he do it? How can he do it? But I'm so cruel. I stand behind a little spruce tree. I thought, oh God, how can he do it? And there's a snowbank there. I thought, that precious mother's going to get her heart broke from out of her. God, I can't look at it. How can he do it? I noticed the gun didn't fire. I turned around to see what it was doing. He was going like this. He was <laughs> shaking. He looked around at me, and those lizard eyes had changed. Great big tears were running off his cheeks. He grabbed that gun, he threw it on the ground, he grabbed me by the pants leg, he said, Billy, I've had enough of it. Lead me to that Jesus that you talk about in Serena. What was it? He saw something real. He saw something it wasn't put on. He saw something that was genuine. He saw a mother's love that would stand in the face of death, or no matter what it was. He saw something real. Not a sermon I preached or a song that the church sung. He's a deacon in a Baptist church now. He caught me by the leg, oh, that's so good. He said, Billy, I've seen something that's real to me. So bad enough. But tell me about it. I fell down the snow and I said, Bert. God said, if they hold their peace, these rocks will cry out. You love him? He said, I want a kind of love for my God that dear had for her baby. And there on that snow drift there, I led that hunter to God. I wonder tonight, how many in here would like to have that kind of love for your Lord? Like that real, that real. She, what did she do? She displayed something that was real. Now, friends, there's so much make-belief today. Let's not take that. 
Let's have something real. It's so late. Let's just stand to our feet and consecrate our lives to God. All that wants God to come into your heart and give you an experience to be a lover of Christ and have the love for Christ that you could face death or anything, the kind of love that that mother dear had for her baby, raise up your head, hands like this. Let us bow our heads. Yes, Lord. We got bomb. There's bomb in Gilead. There's physicians here. God, I pray that you'll help the people now to come and be inoculated. Come and be inoculated from temper, from unbelief. Get ready for that great service tomorrow. Grant it. With our heads bowed, how many of you wants that real Pentecostal Holy Ghost love of God? That's Pentecostal's real love. Would you come stand around the altar while I pray for you? Come move out of your position now while you're standing. Come up here now and say, I want that kind of love, Brother Branham. I want to love my Lord. God bless you. God bless you. That's right. Come from the balcony. He's real way. Come up. This might be the hour that all for life. What's, what's any more greater to you, friend? No matter if you're a church member, that doesn't matter. You say, well, I belong to a Pentecostal church. But if you haven't got that dying love for Christ to display before the world so the people can see. Won't you come? You Pentecostal people that knows that you're living a life. You got temper and you got frustrations and you sometimes fear and doubt. Why don't you come on up? Come around and show God just by coming up. I, I'm sorry, God. I, 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 I want love. I want real love. I want to love you, Lord, like that mother dear loved her baby. You say, but my neighbors, I go to church with them. But your Lord, what about him? But he can come from the balcony. He's more cheap. He's up there. We're standing right here and wait. You young students here from this college, you're going out to be the men of tomorrow, the women of tomorrow. Why don't you come and dedicate your life? We're not asking you to join any Pentecostal church. You stay a Methodist, just what you are. But you come get this experience of the love of God in your heart so sweet that when you go to your parish, wherever God will lead you, young man, young woman, why don't you come and get a real inoculation from sin? Some of you students out there smoking cigarettes, aren't you ashamed? Come here. What John Wesley would have turned in his grave if he had known you being his student of that. Come on up here. Won't you come? Sir, God, get God in your heart, really. Come, won't you? Come out of the balconies. All, oh, all, oh, whosoever will. The prescription's open tonight. We got bomb here in Gilead, and here's the physicians. Right here, take care of that. I'll leave whatever more to leave. We have them here. Won't you come? Won't you come, Reed? Dedicate yourself to God and have an experience. God's going to, now remember, God's going to ask you, why didn't you come? Before morning, if you get sick, you feel pains in your arms. They're coming up around your shoulders. You know what that is, don't you? You're dying. You feel your pulse coming up. Your hand's getting cold. The doctor runs up and says it's a heart attack. The ambulance is screaming. And you feel your life, you're pressing the pill and you know you're going to die. God's going to say, why didn't you come? Well, Lord, I belong to the church. That ain't what he's talking about. Why? Why? Why is there still sin sickness in the church? Is there no bomb to cure it? Yeah, there's bomb to cure it. There's physicians here. Everything's ready. Won't you come? Come now while we're we just a moment.
tape recording of this night will be played over. Jesus Christ that's shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Now every person in here, you around the altar, whatever your trouble is, confess it to God. 
I got temper. I got habits. I'm ashamed of my life. I've done just that and the other. I'm going to pray for you. I want everybody to be there. Our Heavenly Father, these people have come upon the simple word of the living God. And upon the story that happened some 20 years ago when a cruel, hearted hunter to be mean and indifferent that day up there on that snow drift, when he saw a mother deer display a real genuine love he saw something real that's what he wanted surely if God could give that kind of love to an animal he could give it to a man there you give him that great experience of the new birth now father these are standing around the altar there are women, mothers, fathers, children. God, they're standing here ready to receive that love. May they not walk up here in vain, but may they be so determined that they're going to be inoculated from their evil, their thoughts, their, their, their frustrations, their tempers, until the Holy Ghost will fall upon them, Lord, like a rushing mighty wind. Grant it, Lord. Through Jesus Christ's name, I commit them to you. I want you to hear it. Walk right up here around. Son of 